So our work is about the uh, SAN notification um, on resource-constrained uh, platforms for automotive networks. And this is a collaboration between my colleagues, um, Alex Schell and Christopher Hood. So the amount of wireless interfaces is increasing in cars. And besides additional um, benefit for your comfort or um, driver assistance systems, these um, interfaces also provide um, potential attack vectors for attackers. And that this is not a theoretical threat, but an actual one was shown um, several years ago from Milan Velasek, for example. Um, the researcher were able to uh, remotely influence a car, um, and especially some safety critical functions like steering, brake, and the engine. And that this is still possible today um, was recently shown by uh, Tencent Keen Security Lab. Um, yeah, and this is basically due to the absence of security mechanisms in the control area network, um, the most widely used um, communication protocol um, for in-vehicle communication. Um, it's a broadcasting scheme without any authenticity, um, meaning that an, uh, an engine, an ECU, is not able to identify if a received frame was sent by a valid ECU or not. For example, if an attacker manages to get access to some ECU, for example here the telematics, um, he is potentially able to send some malicious frames to the CAN bus. Um, even though we have here a gateway which uh, makes the attack a little bit dif uh, more difficult, um, but these are not in every car. So, for example here, um, ID 48 is usually um, received by the steering ECU. Um, and as I mentioned, the ECU has no way to identify if this frame was sent by a, a legitimate um, ECU or not. So it's a classical impersonation attack. And usually we, you would use um, classic cryptographic algorithms to, um, to prevent that kind of attacks. Um, but they have a lot of overhead, especially in cars where you have small ECUs uh, ECU with low resources. Um, the payload, as I mentioned on the first slide, um, is only 64-bit, so bit, not byte, meaning that this corresponds to, uh, corresponds to the recommended size of a Mac tag. Um, so you can decide if you transfer a Mac tag or your, your payload. Um, the, the reason, uh, that's the reason why in the automotive industry you usually use uh, much more truncated Mac tags, for example, 24 for Mac tag and 8 for freshness counter, and this already halves the available bandwidth of 500 kilobits. Um, it's, but it's still a broadcast um, scheme, meaning that one ECU, uh, if several ECUs receive one frame, um, they all need the shared secret to be able to validate the Mac tag. Um, that means that non repudiation is not possible um, at all. Um, to have that, we need digital signatures, but their overhead is much higher. So another idea are intrusion prevention or detection or prevention systems. Um, here we have signature-based approaches, which um, are only suitable for known attacks. But yeah, one attack we may know, um, which fits for vehicle A, does not uh, automatically fit for vehicle B. Um, so that's a problem. And the anomaly-based um, approaches here you specify the behavior of your communication, for example, but these are very prone to um, false positive. And false positive is a false alarm, and um, you have a lot of traffic in your car. That means that um, even if you have small numbers, you have a high amount of uh, wrong alarms. Another idea are voltage-based send notification. Um, the idea is to use the, or to exploit the voltage characteristics of your analog signal of one frame to identify the sender um, of the frame. And these approaches have high detection rates and really low false positive rates, but high hardware demands. Um, and so our goal was the reduction of the required resources. And this brings us to our approach, at based send identification. And at the very first phase and during the sampling, we do not uh, record the whole frame, but only a single symbol, so one bit more or less. Um, and instead of sampling the whole bit with a high sample rate, we sample several points of several um, um, edges within one frame and combine them afterwards. So you need a um, only um, a ratio of the sampling rate. 
And if you combine that to one uh, composite or representative, something like an average edge, you can then directly feed this into the preprocessing. And here you extract your features, for example, statistical features, or um, we added some features which uh, describe somehow the, the way you as a human look on uh, these kind of signals, so how you distinguish it, maybe um, some differences in the signal or ratios of some points in the signal. And we also consider the cal calculation time. So we could only use uh, features which do not uh, require that much time. Um, then we go to the model generation. So we have the features and the message identifier. And we now can um, calculate or generate one model for each ECU. Um, here we assess, assess the different um, machine learning algorithms and uh, yeah, added some dynamic configuration compared to previous approaches, which lowers the configuration overhead. And then we have our model, which we can use for classification. So now the features are used for classification, and we get one probability for each ECU. So how confident or how probable is it that the, this ECU is the center of the frame we just uh, recorded? Um, you can now just take the ECU with the highest probability as the sender. Um, this is the usual way to do it. But if we, um, we use some kind of two thresholds, um, a first one, um, only if uh, ECU, which is usually, uh, if, only if the probability of that ECU, which usually uh, sends that, that frame, um, if that probability is below a threshold, then we look to the, to the remaining um, probabilities of the other ECUs. And only if one of these probabilities is above a second threshold, um, we raise an alarm. And this has the positive effect that false positives could be um, minimized. And we have a model adjustment phase. Um, we, are performing, uh, we, are, we are monitoring the performance, um, or more or less the confidence of the, of the classifier. And if this performance um, decreases slightly, we can update the model during runtime um, while we still have good classification results. And if you are cars, for example, in a workshop and you have an abrupt drift in your, in your signals, then you have to do a, a model adaption or a model update. But here we do not need to, um, to rebuild the whole model anew. We just need uh, eight or 16 uh, ACUs per frame um, to adapt the model. And here you need, for, of course, uh, some kind of a secured labeling uh, like max or um, yeah, for a short amount of time. So it's not real-time capable compared to using Max um, for the whole communication. And this leads us to the evaluation. Um, so first of all, we looked into how the sendification works. That means what comes out of the classification step. Um, here we uh, considered three setups, um, two vehicles and one prototype setup and overall 90,000 frames, which we recorded. And we have an average identification rate of over 99.98%. And as I mentioned, if we would use this um, as identification directly as anomaly detection, we would end up with a false alarm every uh, 5,000 frames. And yeah, the communication is really high loaded. Um, we have periodically transmitted frames uh, inside in-vehicle communication. And this would end up, for example, one wrong alarm every five minutes. And you cannot decide if it's a real alarm or is it a false positive. So our intrusion detection, um, which is based on threshold, as I mentioned, um, with that we could reduce the false positive to zero and while having a high detection rate of 99.8. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, Maybe you ask how we, how we did the, the attacks. Um, we changed the, the, the origin of the frames during our evaluation uh, on our PC. And so in, in, such, in such a way that each ECU was faked by each ECU to um, ensure that we did not uh, select two ECUs which are, for example, easy uh, or well uh, distinguishable. So while the previous evaluation was static, so the vehicle was stationary and, um, and the engine, except for the Porsche, were, um, were off, uh, we now uh, analyzed um, a summer journey. 
So we <clears throat> had uh, temperatures between 23 and uh, 63 degrees of Celsius or 73 and uh, 96 um, degree of uh, Fahrenheit. Um, we had seven trips, over 70,000 frames, and still a high sanitification rate um, and no false positive. And our second journey during winter for five days, um, yeah, also temperatures um, a little bit lower than before, um, nine trips and 65,000 frames uh, in total. And here we also um, looked at electronic consumers, so if they have influence onto the signal, um, we've used light, vipers, and also the very battery training start-stop automatic, um, and still high identification rates, no false positives. And then for this uh, evaluation, we also um, looked into uh, how the detection rate is. Um, again, we changed 10% of our frames um, and yeah, uh, did some, uh, we changed the origin of 10% of the, of the frames to um, evaluate the detection rate. So, as our goal was to reduce the um, required resources, we've also implemented it on, a, on an embedded platform, which is comparable to microcontrollers, which are currently used in automotive ECUs, like gateways or so. Um, we've used the Cortex M4 180 megahertz microcontroller, which has a DSP for some kind of feature calculations, so just some um, hardware acceleration for some of the features. And we've used the same data set as for the Fiat. Um, here is uh, that we have, we have sent the, the signals via UART, so the sampling was not implemented, but um, the rest of the approach. So during initiation phase, it took us 2.6 uh, six seconds for the model generation. Um, again, 200 frames per ECU. Um, we have eight ECUs here, and we did it in a mini batch as this uh, microcontroller or the board does not have enough uh, memory to hold all the signals um, during training. And for the operation phase, um, here again we have used a logistic regression, and the worst in the worst case it took 125 microseconds per frame to do the calculation. So meaning the the characteristic deviations or the feature extraction and also the uh, standardification and intrusion detection. And if you look here, that's a, a usual size of a CAN frame. Um, here you have an 8-bit uh, of payload and uh, at 500 kilobit um, baud rate. And here we uh, looked onto a bus with 100% utilization, which is not the case to guarantee some safety requirements. Um, but nevertheless, one, um, one frame occupies the bus for over 200 microseconds, and this means that our um, approach is real-time capable in this case. And again, just for, um, for an overview, again, no false positive and standardification rate of 99.94%. Uh, and this brings us more or less to the conclusion. Um, standard identification can provide additional security for uh, CAN networks, especially against uh, impersonation attacks. Um, we've presented edge-based standardification, um, which is a reduction of the resource requirements. Um, it is feasible on automotive hardware. Um, it has high performance. Um, it can be kept up even under varying conditions. Um, and we refined the performance uh, monitoring and model adjustment compared to previous approaches. And as an outlook, um, CAN, yeah, CAN is in the cars today, but the next generation of CAN will be in the newer cars. Um, CAN with flexible data rate. Um, while the systems, the communication system is more or less the same, we have here higher um, bout rates, and this has a direct um, effect on the, on the rising edges, for example. Um, we want to investigate additional mitigation approaches against signal drifts. And of course, we want to implement this, the, the sampling on board, um, not only sending it via uh, UART to the, PC, uh, to the microcontroller. So thank you for attention, and I'm looking forward to hear your questions.
Hi, thank you. I'm Kang Kuk-ji from UT Dallas. Um, thanks for great work. I really enjoyed. And I have two questions. Uh, I appreciate that you demonstrate the like a varying um, like evaluation over the empirical evaluation for the varying conditions. But um, do you can you think of any kind of more um, analytic proof that that your approach is like resilient against any kind of wear and tear or long term like uh, Yes, uh, wear and tears. And second thing is that um, actually your your uh, second question is your uh, your um, the approach is based on model and uh, training. So is there a any kind of ways that you can think of the attacker can subvert your system by like uh, uh, contaminating your model over a long term like uh, yeah. scheme? So okay, so yeah, just, well, thank you for your question. Um, so your first first question was if um, if we. Uh, have some more information about a longer period of time for testing, right? Actually, the, the point is that you empirically actually prove that your your approach is like a vigilant against the cold weather or the the, the hot weather. But the, can we have some more kind of the proof that 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 is going to be uh, resilient even after two years, three years, or something like that? So so that is is there any any kind of systematic like approach that you can think of? Um. I'm not really sure. Maybe we could discuss oh, this. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Detail. Um, but your second question. Sorry, I. So actually, your your approach is based on like uh, model building and training. Ah, yes. Okay, I got. It. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, this is related to this uh, slide, I would say. So um, we are looking here into performance monitoring, and we only uh, use um, frames for the model update. Um, as I said, if the performance decreases slightly. So we still have a high classification, um, or the probabilities are still high. So the, 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 the classification is still really confident about its decisions, but maybe not 100%, but 98 on average. Um, while the, the probabilities of the other ECUs are about 0 or 2%. And this is um, really, um, there's a big difference between these uh, probabilities, and we only use frames for the ad adaption, um, which can be classified really good. And if, as I said, if the model is um, too far away from the reality, so if we get uh, bad performance, um, and then we update the model using uh, Max, for example, so we share a secret um, during, the, during the training um, with the IDS and all ECUs, and then we can just uh, use secured labeled data for the retraining. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, very interesting. I was wondering, uh, you, in the beginning, you motivated the, the approach based on the cost of the message authentication codes or signatures. Did you compare the cost of the classifier execution to these operations on the yeah. same devices? So the problem is not um, doing the calculation of a Mac on one device, but on all devices. And the idea here is to, for example, I didn't mention that, to implement it in the gateway. So you have the fingerprinting in the gateway, and you only forward messages um, if you are really sure which um, ECU has sent that kind of frame. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not, the idea is not to implement it in all ECUs. And if, for example, if you implement Max or use Max for the whole communication, so every, um, your window lifter and so on, and if they have to um, validate and calculate Max, for example, every 10 milliseconds, um, that's not possible with the hardware which is uh, usually used. Okay. And the final quick question is, yeah. would this identification approach be uh, secure again against replay attacks? You mean if someone can just measure the signal at some point on the bus and um, replay Yeah, like it? one of the one of the devices, one of the sensors is, is yeah. compromised and it just replaces other sensors. I have a backup slide for that question. Let's see if I find it. Um, but basically, maybe uh, just so here, we have measured one signal at different locations in the, in the vehicle. And as you can directly see, there is a difference um, when you measure at different points, because the, the, the rising edge or the, the edge is um, affected by the channel between your measuring point and the ECU you are finger fingerprinting. And if you're measuring at a, di <clears throat> at a different point, then you're 
your fingerprint or your characteristics look completely different. Of course, if you are very close um, to the original ECU, that could be maybe be possible. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you.